always feel like these book videos should come with, you know, like when you go to the pictures and you get a disclaimer at the beginning that's like, make yourself comfy, grab your popcorn, turn your phone off and make sure you relax. <laughs> Although I guess if you're either watching this or listening to this on your phone, don't turn it off. <laughs> Just uh, do yourself a favour and put it on do not disturb and then we can shut out all the demons of the outside world and get cosy and comfy and talk about books with no distractions. The dream. Anyway, hello! Welcome back to my channel. How's it going? I hope you're doing really well. Straight back at you today with another instalment of To Be or Not TBR, uh, which is an uh, extremely intellectual, high level, pun based title for what is essentially um, a nice chatty roundup of five books that I've read recently. We'll have a little chat about what they're all about, we'll have a little chat about what I actually thought of them. I'll be honest. And most importantly, whether I reckon you should add it to your ever-growing pile of things that you need to read as soon as possible. Um, for reasons relating to your bank account, <laughs> I'm sorry in advance. So that's how today's seminar is shaping up, folks. I hope you're ready for this one. Uh, but before I get stuck in with the books, I'm just going to chat for a minute or two about today's sponsor, which is Readly, which I thought was the perfect fit for a book video. Readly is a great choice for anybody who loves reading, and it's a really nice way to switch up your usual reading habits, because it's a really slick, easy to use app, which you can pop onto your phone or onto your iPad, depending on where you prefer to read, and it gives you completely unlimited reading to up to 5,000 magazine titles, both national and international, all the huge titles on there that you can think of, like Vogue, Glamour, Red, GQ, as well as all the newspapers as well. So if you'd like to have a little flick through the headlines, you can also do that over on Readly. The most important bit of info is that I have a link in my description box below this video, which will let you try Readly for free for six whole weeks to see how you get on with it and see how you like it. You can cancel it absolutely any time and after your free trial runs out after six whole weeks, it's $9.99 a month for unlimited access to magazine reading. I've used this app for a really long time now, I've talked about it before and it's one of my favourite ways to unwind. It's great for travelling if you've got any big trips coming up or if you're back to commuting each day and I love finding like a quiet half an hour if we've got a bit of an empty weekend, just curling up with what's effectively a huge stack of magazines all in one place to have a lovely slow browse through. Here's a couple of my favourites you can kind of go through and bookmark your favourites so that when you head over to the my content page you've got all your fave titles in one place. Adam is forever browsing through the BBC Good Food magazine to find new recipes. Recipe for nachos <laughs> seems to be one that he was last browsing on here. And probably my personal fave, I love having a look through the craft magazines. Um, there's one called Molly Makes, which is the magazine that I always look forward to the most when it comes out every month. And I end up bookmarking a ton of pages in there, full of good intentions of things that I'm gonna create and make for myself. The bookmarking tool is really useful, actually. We use that a lot in this house. Um, but there's also searchable topics that you can use to find new magazines that might interest you. You can save magazines for offline reading, which is great if you're traveling. And also what I think is particularly great is the sharing function. You can actually share one account across five different devices, so if you've got a family that all love reading, or maybe you share a love of reading with your housemates, then it's a really nice way to share that together. So that is the magic of Readly, and if you are intrigued, if you quite like the look of it, if you want to give it a try, then don't forget there is a link in the description box down below. So I'm going to pop that right under this video, you can head down there and click the link, that will take you straight through to your six week free trial, which you can cancel at any time, and see how it fits into your own reading routine. Uh, I've also just realised that I haven't actually picked up the books that I'm going to talk about, so <laughs> I'll be right back. And try not to spill my tea. Okay, I think we're kicking off with a pretty iconic one to start with today. I think loads of you will have read this. I feel like it's a bit of a, it's a modern day giant is what I'm gonna call it. And this is The Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller. Yeah, spoiler alert, I absolutely loved this book so much. In fact, I didn't just love this book. I love this book so much that I actually, uh, I bought this uh, very special edition hardback, which is also, wait for it, signed. <laughs> so cool. I just thought it was so beautiful and it felt like a book that I should own a special copy of because I enjoyed it so much. Basically I just really need to calm down when I enjoy things. <laughs> so if you are all too familiar with this one and you're kind of sick of hearing people talk about it right now, feel free to skip on to book number two. Um, but for anyone who isn't familiar with it or hasn't picked it up yet, this is one of those books that's kind of a retelling of Greek mythology. It seems to be a really popular thing at the moment. I feel like these kind of myth retellings are having a real moment right now. So The Song of Achilles is based off the events of Homer's Iliad. 
um, which if you're anything like me will tell you absolutely nothing because the extent of my Greek mythology knowledge is basically like who put the glad in gladiator Hercules but the main thing you need to know is that this story revolves around the love story between Achilles who's kind of like the main hero and Patroclus 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 I'm gonna go for Patroclus and kind of the famous story of Achilles and the Battle of Troy is told from the the POV of Patroclus so Achilles himself is a beautiful creation put on the earth. He's the son of a goddess and a king. He's incredibly super strong. He's an absolute legend in battle. He's a bit of a bee knock around Greece. <laughs> and on the flip side, Patroclus is small and meek and awkward. They're brought together by chance. They form this amazing inseparable bond together and it turns into love. And their love is so adorable and pure and perfect and cute and just want to squish it. But then old bloody Helen over there gets kidnapped, doesn't she? So all of the heroes of Greece are called upon to come together to wage war on Troy to win her back. And Achilles steps up to the mark to take part in that war. And you guessed it because he loves him so much, Patroclus follows Achilles into the war and uh, the rest, as they say, is Greek mythology, baby. Probably any of the kind of Greek mythology retellings, they take a little bit of adjusting to get used to when you read them for the first time. Not just because the names of all the characters are a little bit tricky to get a grasp of and it can be a bit of a challenge to kind of remember who everybody is. And I also think the writing style is a little bit different because it can be almost, especially, especially with Son of Achilles, it can be almost quite lyrical, which obviously matches the whole kind of vibe of mythology. Like this one has a really gorgeous, very, very beautiful, almost like a poetic flow to it through the story. It's, it's lyrical writing. It, it really kind of strikes you as being beautiful. So I think if you've been reading a lot of maybe more kind of conversational fiction, it can take a little while to flip your brain over to something a little bit more poetic. But when I tell you this book is beautiful. It's like the understatement of the century. When I was making notes for this book, one of the words I wrote was enchanting, which seems so ridiculous and overblown, but I promise you it's true. The war is basically a subplot that complements the actual story, which is the love that develops between the two main characters. And because as well it's told through Patroclus's... Patroclus's? I'm gonna call him Patty. <laughs> because it's told through Paddy's POV. Achilles, rather than being this like legendary mythology superhero, becomes completely humanized and he turns into this character who's a flawed man with lots of vulnerabilities and you see him as a child. And as a story, it just covers this whole enormous spectrum of emotion. Like the first third of this book, I think when they're kids, is quite slow paced and it almost feels quite gentle and wholesome. And the total flip side is that the final third of the story is so like fast paced and tragic. And it's all about war and it's quite ferocious. It's this full spectrum of like every emotion you can possibly imagine that covers all the extremes from the purest kind of love to the ultimate kind of cruelty. So I think I've raved about this one enough, but also as a side note, how amazingly clever does an author have to be to take a story like the Battle of Troy and a hero like Achilles, who we've all heard of a million times, and make it feel like something brand new and it feels completely relevant to a modern audience. I just think that's that's some kind of genius to be able to do that. It's incredibly clever. Oh, and by the way, I will just warn you in advance that uh, the last couple of pages, um, the last paragraph will ruin your life. <laughs> so just a heads up for emotional damage, caused by the Song of Achilles, but this is a definite TBR. Put it at the top of your pile. Okay, number two, I am slightly scared to talk about this, I'm not gonna lie. This is A Court of Thorns and Roses by Sarah J. Mass. Maz? Yep, it's Akotar time, everybody. Da -da -da -da. Da -da -da -da. So, so many of you had told me to start this book and start this series and get into this universe. Um, and I, do you know what? I was so ready for that. I was so ready to become like alarmingly obsessed with a fantasy universe. It's been a while. I'd say the last one was probably when I read The Hunger Games. It's been a while since I've had that real like, oh my God, I love this universe. So I would say this is fantasy with a capital F for fairies. <laughs> and I don't mean like Tinkerbell 
delicate lace wings jumping from a flower petal to a babbling brook. These are steamy, sexy, handsome fairies who will rip your clothes off with their sharply pointed ears, my friend. So that's what you need to know. Get into it, all right? We meet Pharaoh. She is a young girl who is supporting her family who have fallen on hard times. They've got no money. And she's out hunting for food to be able to support them through the winter uh, when she spots a deer that's about to be attacked by a wolf. And she goes into kind of full predator mode. She wants that deer to feed her family. So she kills the wolf. Turns out that was an absolute terrible idea from Pharaoh because the wolf was in fact a shape-shifting fairy and she's just murdered him. Hey. As punishment for her crime, she's kind of seized by the fairies and taken back off to their magical kingdom. She's gonna be a prisoner there and her captor, who's called Tamlin, well, let's just say that he's a little bit of a dish. He's very charming and attractive, although half of his face is concealed by a bejeweled mask that can't be removed. Obviously that only adds to his mysterious kind of charm. And as time goes on and Pharaoh is held captive at his palace, she begins to learn why she's being so closely guarded. She begins to learn why these fairy lands are such a dangerous place for her to find herself and that there's an ancient curse which hangs over the place. If she doesn't destroy the curse for good, she's gonna lose this sexy fairy hunk for good, not to mention bring on the end of the world as she knows it. So like with all good fantasy, you have to go into this knowing what you're dealing with. You know, it's really fun to read, it's magical, it's something a little bit different. So if you don't let yourself kind of let go and get involved with it, then you're not gonna enjoy it. So I dived into this ready to really enjoy it and like embrace all of that. I was ready to have a good old time with it, you know, but weirdly I found that like the fantasy of this, I mean, so far through book one anyway, the fantasy element is almost like a cherry on top. The fantasy is just kind of there to make it a little bit different and a bit more exciting and like put it in another universe, but it's mostly about the YA-esque romance that develops between Feyre and Tamlin in my opinion, but I'm totally here for that because I love a YA romance and I love a bit of magic, so it's a win-win. Unfortunately, I, I hate saying negative things about books. I found probably, <laughs> I'm gonna say literally like this much. The first two thirds of this book were extremely slow. It just felt unbelievably slow. It felt like, I said to a friend, it felt like an emo version of Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> which on paper sounds great. But since admitting that I found it very, very slow for the majority of the book, I mentioned that on Instagram and loads of people replied saying, yeah, that is absolutely the case. This book kind of just exists to open up the universe and set things out. I've been told many times that things really kick off in book two. So I'm looking forward to that and I will read it, but that doesn't change the fact that a lot of this book is quite slow and boring. But then, <laughs> dot, 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 suddenly, capital letters exclamation mark, something changes. As if from nowhere, when you get to about this point, this book kicks into overdrive and the last section literally feels like a completely different story. Feyre suddenly stops being annoying and becomes a bit of a badass. Everything that's kind of made no sense at all suddenly starts to make a little bit of sense. All the drama kicks off and the last bit is really, really good. So I think maybe what I had an issue with was the pacing is not quite right for me. Um, and a lot of the kind of fluffy stuff in the beginning could be cut to get to the more exciting bit at the end, which then felt a little bit rushed. Aside from that, I would say, I think Tamlin is extremely boring. He may be very handsome, but I hope he gets slightly more interesting. And also the fact that they fell in love so quickly red flags. I was a lot more interested in Rysand, uh, the kind of bad boy figure who pops up later down the line. So I am going to give the second one a try for sure. I was thinking actually, I'd kind of forgotten that I was going to read this series and then thinking about this book today, I thought maybe I would film my first ever reading vlog when I do the second one because I know people love that second book. And I think if I'd read this when I was 16, I would have literally lived and died for it. So I would say Put it on your TBR pile. It's kind of an iconic, fun, new fantasy series and it's got a giant evil worm. <laughs> Number three, this is The Secret History by Donna Tartt. There's some big players today. <laughs> I didn't know when I humbly picked up this book that 
I was gonna discover that my true destiny was to move to New England and find myself in a mysterious inner circle of young rich scholars who get too sucked into their weird Greek studies and become completely obsessed with various forms of darkness and evil while they just constantly talk about wanting to live forever. I didn't know that's what I was gonna want from life. <laughs> But here we are. Again, this is one that I think loads of you will have already read and formed opinions on. Um, so feel free to skip on to the next one if you'd like to. Uh, but if you're not familiar with the secret history, this is told from the perspective of Richard. He's kind of looking back at the days when he was studying classics at a liberal arts college in Vermont and what unfolded while he was at college. So we first meet Richard, he starts off, he's a pretty unhappy guy, he's very embarrassed of where he comes from. And one of the quotes I wrote, I wrote it in my notes, um, he says that he feels a morbid longing for the picturesque at all costs. Which is actually like quite a neat little summary almost of the secret history, but anyway. So when Richard is denied being able to join a very select ancient Greek course at his university, he's not allowed to join the classes, he very quickly becomes completely obsessed with this mysterious bunch of students who study that course, who are kind of a group all together, um, and they're part of that selective program along with their highly intelligent, very charismatic professor. To Richard, they seem like a bit of a cult. They're all super rich. They're kind of like trust fund kids. They're very insular. They don't really mingle with anybody else. They've got an air of superiority about them. And Richard wants in, all he wants is to become immersed in this world and to become a part of their group. And that doesn't even change when he learns that they are dabbling in the dark arts of murder. But that's not a spoiler either. We find out in the prologue itself that Richard and the rest of the group have murdered one of the people that they are supposed to be very close friends with. So the secret history is then told in two parts. The first part is the lead up to the murder and how we reach that point. And then the second part is what proceeds after the murder. And actually explaining this summary to you is not really particularly helpful because this book is about something that's not the plot which I realise makes literally zero sense. So I read this because it had been on my list for ages and it felt like, you know those books that you, you feel like you're missing out because you've never read them, you're really missing something. It's a total cult classic. And now that I have crossed it off my list, I can say that I absolutely loved it. I looked forward to reading this every single time I picked it up. Um, but I definitely haven't ever read anything like this before. And this is where I'm gonna start to sound slightly insane because when I was thinking about what I wanted to say about this book and when I was kind of making notes about it to make this video, I found it really difficult to think of what I actually wanted to say about it. And for some reason, it feels like the thoughts you have about this book, it honestly feels like something you should just keep to yourself, mull over for the next like three years on and off constantly until you decide to pick it up again and read it again and then continue that cycle for the rest of your life. At the risk of sounding like a crazy person, talking out loud about this book almost feels like you're you're breaking the magic around it almost. Something about the way this book is written, even though it's nothing to do with magic really, it's got the tiniest little hint, kind of like a dark little, like a whisper or a breath of like a dark supernatural kind of quality to it. Um, I feel like I'm getting more and more insane as I describe this book. It's got a real kind of hypnotic, dreamlike, it's, it almost feels a little bit kind of hazy and cloudy and like a lull when you're reading it. And somehow that really draws you in with a hypnotic feeling, even though it's set in like 1980s Vermont, which doesn't strike me as, as particularly magical <laughs> or dark. You find yourself meeting these pretty horrible characters who don't have a lot of redeeming qualities really but you're still very much sucked into them and you feel this kind of sympathy towards them and somehow they're still charming to you maybe because it's told through Richard's narrative and that's that's how he felt about them I guess it feels completely real and obviously like the college element to it feels completely real but also completely unreal at the exact same time, which I think makes it the perfect book to project your own experiences onto when it comes to things like friendship and wanting acceptance and validation and the lengths that people will go to to feel like they fit in. And the, the, the feeling that I kept like thinking of was 
the it's like the most extreme example obviously a really extreme example of those nights when you're with your very best friends and you feel like you own the world together and you feel like you're completely invincible with one another i don't know i honestly think it's best to just dive in and experience this one for yourself because i think it is that i think it's a reading experience rather than something that you can just be like oh the writing is clever and this and that like it's a feeling <laughs> which sounds so pretentious and crazy but the feeling you get from this book matches what the book is all about which is the highest level of skill well this maybe sums up how absolutely ridiculous my reading choices are because <laughs> at number four we're going from the secret history to the amazing Mr. Blunden. If you came to see variety in a book video, then you got it, my friends. So yes, this is an extremely random choice. Um, if you've never heard of The Amazing Mr. Blunden, this is a children's book. So this was actually a little surprise present from my mum at Christmas. Um, and the kind of tale is that we read this, well, we tried to read this when I was young, but as soon as the ghost children get introduced into this tale, I absolutely refused to read any further. I was completely traumatized, terrified and horrified and we never finished it. I mean, I feel like you can't really blame me. There is absolutely nothing more terrifying than like Victorian ghost children. But I think she decided that it was, uh, it was time that I finally get to the end of this and find out what happens to the amazing Mr. Blunden. I think originally this is called The Ghosts, by the way. But maybe you have kids who might like it. Maybe you've got kids who are bookworms. Um, but this is all about Lucy and Jamie. They live with their mum in Camden Town in London and their father has died so they're on very hard times they're struggling for money their mum is really kind of trying to trying to keep everything together as best she can but then one day a mysterious old gentleman knocks on the door he's strangely dressed like he's from the olden days he seems to vanish after he's sp finished speaking and he has an interesting offer he offers the children and their mother the chance to look after a gorgeous old home in the countryside kind of all expenses paid they can live there as long as they keep it clean and look after this huge house but as you might imagine this mystery house is full of secrets there's whisperings in the air there's strange shadows lurking on the stairs strange cries for help there's ghost children, the ghost children. It's obviously a kid's book, but it's got this kind of very, very mild, slight darkness, gothic-ish, like little kind of brush strokes of gothic, like formidable house vibe to it. And it genuinely is still like a little bit spooky, but in a very gentle way. Um, it's extremely old. I think it was written, let's have a look. This was first written 1969. And unsurprisingly, there is like, a little bit of a there's like some religious undertones woven through there as there often was in kids literature back in the day and some of that feels a little bit dated but the cool part of this story is that even though it was written so long ago the fact that it's the children that get to time travel and the children that are ghosts and the children that get to be heroes and the children that have to be clever and figure out how to solve the situation like that actually makes it feel very cool and i think even now this would be a really exciting read if you were kind of around like 10 years old i mean or 30 years old so yeah this is a little bit of a strange edition but i wanted to include it anyway because it still counts uh definitely a tbr if you happen to be 11 years old but also i mean how fun to go back and read the novels that you used to absolutely love when you were little like what a lovely kind of comforting thing to do for yourself so yeah the Amazing Mr. Blunden. Sorry if this traumatizes your children. And last, but certainly not least for today, uh, this, number five, this is Small Cha- Nope. <laughs> this is Small Pleasures by Claire Chambers, not Small Chambers by Claire Pleasures. I think there's two main reasons that I picked this one up. Number one, this cover is kind of strangely beautiful, isn't it? I feel like there's just something about the, the color combo, the vintage illustration style. Hmm oranges. I think the main reason though was that this was a selection in the book club that I do with my friends. So Small Pleasures is set in the 50s out in the suburbs of London and it's the story of Jean. She works at her local newspaper, she's a journalist, um, but she is quite lonely, she doesn't do a lot with her life, she doesn't have any friends, she's never met a partner, she still lives at home with her mum and she's not really got anything going on but then one day at work there's this 
very intriguing letter that comes in from the general public. A young woman called Gretchen has written in to let them know that her daughter was born by a virgin birth. Um, which obviously catches everybody's attention. Jean, as like the only woman who works in the journalist part of the paper, is given the story by all the men at work. She's given that story to investigate for herself. So as Jean starts to get close to Gretchen, both of their lives start to become kind of interwoven together as they grow closer. Jean strikes up a close relationship with the daughter. And while that's all happening, Jean suddenly comes across Without, without any spoilers popping up here, Jean suddenly comes across the opportunity for true happiness and she meets someone who she falls absolutely head over heels hard in love with. But as there always is in any good fiction, happiness will come with a price to pay. Dun dun dun! And there's also, at the beginning of this book, a very mysterious, unexplained newspaper clipping on the first page. Dun dun dun, again. I was really torn about this book. I, as soon as I read the blurb, I absolutely loved the premise of this story. I thought the concept of having a virgin birth set in like contemporary society was the coolest idea for a fiction book. And to be honest, I wanted way more of that like mystery plot line. I wanted the book to be way, way more about that rather than what it actually develops into, which is more about the relationships that Jean makes during the investigative process. The parts that were about the virgin birth and like the parts where Jean was doing her investigative journalism and meeting all the different sources and getting all the different sides to Gretchen's story, those were the parts that I really, really enjoyed and I wanted to learn more and I wanted like a big unfolding mystery plot line, but actually that's not that's not really what this book is about. The book is about Jean. I think it's a very clever art when an author can describe really kind of almost like mundane domestic life in a beautiful, compelling kind of way. And this author is really good at that. But, and it's a big but, <laughs> where this book lost a star for me because the ending is completely, when I say mad, I mean literally blindsiding. It comes from nowhere. I was so completely unsuspecting and then when I read it I was literally just like staring at the page like oh. The way that all the different relationships between the characters kind of unfold and grow is quite like tender and heartwarming and it's a little bit of a slow pace to it. It's very gentle and then all of a sudden you're just smacked around the chops by this mad ending. Maybe that's genius because these things do appear out of nowhere in life and when you're writing kind of like a domestic kind of story these life does like to throw curveballs at you when you're least expecting it and when everything else is going quite smoothly but and i respect that that's clever but god at the same time as a reader it was so unsatisfying and i quite rate it in terms of like brave author decisions I think I do quite rate like writing a book and then completely at the last end just going right turn like I think it's quite brave but I did not like it I respect it but I do not like it so this for me is a maybe it's a maybe TBR although I feel like I've probably quite intrigued you with what happens at the end of the book there so that is five books I read recently to be or not TBR you decide. And now I can't wait to have a chat with you in the comments about all of these. So let me know which of these you have read for yourself. Are any of them absolute must reads for you? And don't forget as well, if you want to give Readly a go, if you fancy unlimited magazine reading, underneath this video, you'll find a link that will take you straight through to a six week free trial, which you can cancel anytime. I'll also make sure to link my Instagram page. I will link my Goodreads and my story graph if you want to keep up with what I'm reading at the moment. And that's all. So thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you very soon with another video. Mwah.